So before I couldn't read the, the exact title of his uh, talk, so apologize for that, Donald. But next one is Mark Cohen. He's going to talk about lunar daytime, architectural, and behavioral experiments on uh, lunar habitats. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the purpose of this talk is to address the issue of what is a good design for a space habitat versus what is a bad design for a space habitat. How do we know the difference? And how can we determine that in a way that has scientific validity? So. Um, Traditionally, the limitations of habitat analog research, particularly human behavioral research, are the difficulty of producing scientifically valid results. Historically, habitability researchers have been limited to qualitative surveys and questionnaires. What this project, Lunar Daytime, will demonstrate is the efficacy of developing a modifiable environmental analog as a behavioral laboratory that can produce empirical, measurable, and quantitative data sets. So th the reason is that researchers must be able to make and control changes to desired independent variables in the physical living and working environment. That means to change physical features, architectural plan, and design features of the habitat to see how it affects crew productivity, crew sense of well-being, crew health, and so on. So um, the purpose of linear daytime is to overcome these historic limitations through the, through the modifiable habitat, to measure effects on crew behavior, where the changes in the environment are changes to the independent variable and the effects on crew behavior, mood, and performance, and productivity constitute the dependent variable. So why do we call it lunar daytime? Because we are aiming at 14-day surface missions on the moon. Because once we actually do land crews on the moon for hopefully longer durations than Apollo, they will be limited to 14-day visits until we have a nuclear power reactor available to keep the power on during the lunar night. So therefore, lunar daytime, two weeks. An another advantage of, of that is that if we're, if we're doing two week long simulations, we can get many more runs for the same amount of money compared to saying, okay, we've got to do this for nine months because there's, gonna, gonna, there's some concept that, you, that all space missions are really long duration. So that's, that's another advantage. Many more runs, much larger N. So there are many pos potential variations in interior architecture that we would be able to test and do different runs with different interior configurations. So there are two major objectives here. One is to create a space habitat analog research facility specifically designed to accommodate experimental modifications <clears throat> in the physical and perceptual living and working environment, and to demonstrate the ability of this environmental behavioral labo laboratory to investigate and address the critical factors that play impor important roles <clears throat> in human health and well-being in an ice, which is an isolated and confined environment. So our goal here, short term, is to build a module as part of the multipurpose research station at the University of North Dakota. The MPRS currently consists of a five module laboratory human planetary or planetary habitat analog complex built from two NASA EPSCOR grants, and I was served as a consultant for the habitat design on the first EPSCOR there. <clears throat> and we seek to expand the existing simulation facility as uh, the most efficient path for realing, realizing these near-term goals. And the addition of this sixth module will accommodate a, a range of spatial and visual experimental configurations. 
to address habitat and psycho psychosocial factors driving from the design. So this is the uh, a view of the early phase of the first EPSCOR grant where uh, the university built this analog habitat uh, to simulate an inflatable with these, these space truss elements holding a, a rigid frame around which the inflatable was attached. And uh, this, this was a view of the um, first deployment exercise they did, which I believe was the summer of 2014. And um, or <coughs> in 2014 anyway. Um, and uh, the integrated habitat system incorporated spacesuits, suit ports for my patent, and the rover analog. So this is what it looked like in January of this year with five elements. The original inflatable so simulated habitat uh, is the one in the, the largest one in the center. And so we have uh, put together several hypotheses as examples of the types of investigations we would pursue. Hypothesis one, the privacy of sleep quarters. Now, a lot of these things people will say, this is just common sense. Everybody knows this. But in fact, NASA does not act like we know this, like this is common sense in a lot of cases. And so um, <clears throat> the hypothesis is that providing individual private quarters will produce better outcomes, such as lower stress, reduced interpersonal conflict, higher well-being, more positive moods, more restful sleep than shared or common sleep quarters. And we would test multiple different configurations. Hypothesis two is windows. That digital display windows will provide reductions in stress and the sense of confinement. And proposed characteristics to be tested include geometry, size, and location. Now, obviously, one of the controls you'd want to test this against are actual windows, but then you have the problem of what are they looking at? I mean, we uh, would have a problem with having the crew look out at a university parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, hypothesis three, circulation patterns. A module traffic pattern that creates a circulation loop will elicit functional and crew interaction differences from a non-loop tree pattern or dead-end pattern such as existed on Mir and exists on ISS. And these differences include increased social action, positive or negative, and efficiency in response to emergency egress and access and normal operations. Hypothesis four, physical and perceptual order. A habitat with physical order and visually clean appearance will increase work output and positive effects in crew function, mood, performance, and productivity. So here on the lower <coughs> picture is the U.S. Destiny Lab on ISS, and the I irony is that the astronaut in the Hawaiian shirt has the most visually orderly element in the whole picture. <laughs> um, so our expected results are that we will validate the fully operational modifiable space analog behavioral laboratory. The series of experiments will demonstrate utility and flexibility of performing behavioral studies in a modifiable analog laboratory facility. It will also facilitate a new paradigm of behavioral research that moves beyond passive observation and the collection of expert opinions from so-called subject matter experts. Because one of the things we've run into time and again is that uh, the people in the bureaucracy will say, well, we can just put together some subject matter experts and they'll tell us what to do. And, and, and we don't need to do any experiments because you've asked the questions and now we can put those to the subject matter experts. But you know, where do the subject matter experts get their knowledge from? Uh, that's an unexplored area. And if you probe very deep, you, you don't find much far too often. And the uh, lunar daytime will provide a heretofore unavailable degree of physical manipulation of the living environment that will lead 
to more definitive and complex mission simulation research, as well as provide for synergies between joint interdisciplinary efforts, such as space architects and behavioral researchers from sociology and psychology. Okay, I think that's the last one. Yes. Questions? Yeah. So the um, usable volume on the ISS compared to a terrestrial analog is huge because of the weightless conditions give you access to the full volume. If we're on the lunar surface with one-sixth G, is the analogs that we've developed for ISS a better approximation or those for Earth a better approximation? And how are you, how do you think that should be scaled? Well, um, I have talked to a number of astronauts and also the psychologists at JSC uh, about the extent to which the experience of microgravity affects visual perception. And there really isn't any agreement. I have heard anecdotes that when you're in microgravity, the environment somehow seems bigger. Other um, opinions that there's no difference at all. So it's one of these areas that's completely unresearched. I would say that since we're on Earth, we have a 1G environment, and uh, the gravity in 1G, I mean, the 1 6 G environment on the moon provides at least the fact that things fall down, and if you put them down someplace, they'll stay in their place. Uh, I would say that doing these experiments in 1G is the best we're going to have until we can do experiments in a comparable habitat on the moon. Other question? Madhu? Uh, David, I also think that uh, the work that uh, Mike Gernhardt is doing on the next step suggests that we already use a, a up and down on station. Uh, we know the floors, uh, the patterns on the top and the bottom, ceiling and floor are different. Uh, but the question to you, Mark, is for a long time, we've had uh, um, vehicles that ply um, underwater, that go on the air, and for long lengths of time. How, do we have anything, um, uh, do we correlate our modules and designs to anything of that sort? Do we get to any data out of those? Well, Madhu, um Data, you know, it, there's very little work that's done to address the issue that this is about, which is how do we define what is a good design for a space habitat versus what is a not good design, you know. Um, and while there, there may be some techniques or, or models that, that we can apply, that we can think about applying, uh, no, the answer is no. Carol. Oh, there were people waiting at the back. Oh, okay. Which one? Okay. Who was the one that had the hands? Uh, who was the one? <laughs> okay, so you go. What is it? You? Who was the one? Okay. You? All right. We we're wasting my time. <laughs> okay, sorry. Is this working? Okay. Um, I have an uh, experimental question. Um, you, you talk about these psychosocial factors, or whatever. You're measuring a reduction in stress, you know, depending on the configuration of the windows. What exactly are those factors? I'm just curious. Uh, well, I guess how do you how do you measure stress? I guess. Well, there there are, there are a, a variety of of modern instruments you that basically work off of uh, measuring galvanic skin resistance. There are. Um, observational techniques. We have a PhD psych in psychology, Cheryl Bishop, who just went emeritus at, at uh, Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, uh, who, who is uh, leading that aspect of the work. Um, and I'm, I'm really more of the sort of the, the project manager and, and instigator. But we do, we do have, we do have a, a whole team of, of social scientists who are involved. All right. Thank you.